Let's do it. All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another exciting episode of the Marxism Today podcast. I am Tony Schmidt, here with Red Wagner. Hello! And I thought, since we had talked a bit about me, that probably it would be good to talk a little bit about Mr. Red Wagner, since I don't believe there's been much... I mean, this has been your podcast for a long time, but it's not been content around you, but around Marxism. Yep. So, tell us, what makes Red Wagner tick? (laughs) 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 What gets you out of bed in the morning? What gets me out of bed in the morning? (laughs) Answer that how you will. Yeah, well, I mean, what makes me tick is a large philosophical question. I don't know if I know the answer to that. (laughs) What gets me out of bed in the morning? That This is just, this is almost a snarky answer. It's so literal. It's just, I don't know, I I wake up to go to work most days, and then on the weekends, I wake up because I'm used to waking up at that time. (laughs) Uh, I don't know, I I think part of what your question is, like, what motivates me? Yeah. And there's lots of ways to answer that. I mean, specifically, I think what we know, what listeners know me as, is as a host of this podcast, so I can talk about what motivated me to, to start this podcast. Part of it was... I, you know, like a lot of Marxists, um, or a lot of people that end up, uh, deciding to call themselves Marxists, at least in the U.S., I learned largely about Marxism while I was in college. Not, not to say that every Marxist goes to college, but I, I think probably, I would guess that a lot of Marxists did at least go to college. Because I think that that is where, well, unlike being a Republican or a Democrat, you kind of have to know what you're talking about to call yourself a Marxist, at least if you're going to do it after high school. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, uh, because it's so, at least in the U.S. and places that I've been, it's oftentimes not respected or not not considered as a, a legitimate point of view or a legitimate even... Uh, you know, theory or way of looking at the world. And so if you can't speak intelligently about it on your own, then people write you off. And I mean, usually they start from writing you off. And if you can speak intelligently about it, then they, they might take back their writing off. And I think where I began to be able to speak intelligently about it, I don't know, I would like to think that I could a little bit in high school, but I'm Probably that's not entirely true. <laughs> and so I, I learned a lot about Marx in college. I actually, you know, uh, this actually really annoyed me how there's this conception that uh, m- college professors are all Marxists and the, the, the college is so far to the left of the political spectrum. That That always bugged me because the college I went to I actually had a lot of Christian professors who would feel very confident in expressing their Christianity. And not to say that their Christianity was like right-wing Christianity or anything like that, but that was, if if there was one view that they were exposing or, or uh, you know, uh, something about themselves that they presented in class, the most predominant one by far was actually Christianity. Which, you know, there are Christians on the left of the political spectrum and on the right. But that's just happened to be what it was. And it, I, I was at college for at least one year, if not two, before I ran into a professor who identified as a Marxist and was interested in, in, in Marxist theory and, and, um, willing to talk about it in class. Which was great for me because it was something I was really interested in and wanted to learn more about. Which uh, which professor is that, if you don't mind? Oh yeah, that... since I went to the same school as you for a while. Yeah, for for listeners, I many of you won't know this school, but I I went to the University of Wisconsin Eau Claire, 
which is uh, just like a state uh, school up in northern Wisconsin, um, at not actually very far from the Twin Cities, uh, Minneapolis and St. Paul in Minnesota. But it was in northern Wisconsin, there it was, University of Wisconsin-Eau Claire. Um, I think about 10,000 students was the size or yeah. so. And uh, not a bad school, but not like, uh, you know, not like the UW-Madison here, which is, you know, a big-name school, very large and everything like that. So, you know, the, it felt very small town to me, coming, having grown up in a larger area. But uh, the professor was Stacy Thompson. Okay. That's what I thought you were going to say. Yeah, Stacy Thompson, a man. Yeah, not not a lot of men have the name Stacy, but Stacy Thompson did, and I don't know, it's like a boy named Sue kind of thing. Like he he was uh he was he was a great professor because actually even even if it hadn't been for him being having the same interest as me, because you know you can meet someone who has the same interest as you who is not compelling or you know you don't click with that person or whatever like you know just the fact that you like the same thing doesn't mean that you're going to respect that person or get along with them or whatever but i thought stacy thompson was was really a very good professor like he he took the the education of students very seriously and was i thought very good at it and and, and involved a lot of it, it actually it was really funny because at the time i was studying my major was english education and uh for that major i had to study a lot of educational theory and it was really interesting to hear stacy talk about his approach to teaching because he had not like many college professors you don't actually need to learn about the theory of education you know pedagogy is the official term for that pedagogy is like the study of learning or something like that but stacy had arrived at the same conclusions that the school of so the school of education taught us a particular method of education that was you know more effective than other methods you learn about all these different teaching methods and learning methods and you learn which ones are more effective and not and stacy had arrived at the same conclusion but not by doing, you know, like trials of this or that or, or other educational theory. He described it in a very socialist way, which was really interesting to me because the, the to just boil this down, and, and probably this is the same today, I don't know, educational theory does go through fads and, and stuff like that and changes. Uh, but when I was in college, the predominant educational theory was called constructivism. And constructivism, it's such an odd term, but this is what it means. It means that knowledge is constructed by the learner. And so the, the point of the educator is to provide an experience that will allow the learner to cons construct their own knowledge. Okay. And, and this is opposed to the view, like the, to contrast this, because that kind of makes sense, but the, to understand what it really means, you need to contrast it with, with the opposing view, which is that the teacher knows a bunch of stuff and is going to tell the students those things, and then the students will know it because the teacher has told them. <laughs> uh, which, I mean, that's... Standard lecture class. Yeah, yeah, standard lecture class, and I mean... It's not to say that that isn't true. Like, if I tell you something and you write it down and you read it and study it, you will be able to recall that thing via memorization. Like, it's there's nothing about it that's objectively false. The question just is, what is the more effective means of becoming an educated person? Now, does this vary based upon, uh, like, level that people are at in schooling and age? Because I'd imagine that the con constructionism, is that what you call it? Constructivism. Constructivism. Yeah. I imagine, I could see that working really well for, like, elementary and middle school and maybe even some high school. But then once you get the kids to start learning to think, I would... I wonder, is is that still the most effective way, or is it not as necessary as kids, you know, once they learn to think and construct thoughts on their own? I, that's a question you can answer. Yeah, so I, I would say that what was the theory that I learned 
and of my own opinion, because I mainly agree with it. Maybe I was indoctrinated, but I think I agree with it anyway, even if I hadn't been taught this, is that it's almost always superior. Okay. I mean, it, it's not an age-based thing. And, and uh, because uh, a lot of our um, professors at the college level would th- take the constructivist approach in teaching us how to teach. So that, I mean, that makes sense. And, it, and if you think about it, like, that means, okay, I need to have an experience of having taught someone and then learn from that experience and draw my own conclusions from it, you know, that makes a lot of sense. That totally fits into the constructivist framework. But Stacy had arrived at the same conclusions because of his commitment to to uh, Marxism, you know, in in the same way that... Students learn best by constructing their own knowledge. You you can see that is students basically taking control of their own education. It's a very similar parallel to workers owning the means of production or, or controlling their own workplace. If workers control their own workplace, students should basically control their own learning space. And, and it's not bad to have a teacher that, that helps facilitate that and helps guide them and blah, blah, blah. But when you get down to it, when you get down to, you know, are you going to take this method or this other method, then you end up arriving at the same conclusion that it's best for students to, you know, have control over their experiences, draw their own lessons, and and learn from doing that. Yeah, and I wish my little sister were here because she, as you are aware of but listeners aren't, is... Getting her second, she's finishing up a master's in special education and getting a master's in education administration. Mm-hmm. So I'd be interested to see if, and she's going to uh, Whitewater and UW Madison. So I'd be curious to see if that's the same sort of thing. I'm going to have to talk to her after this and see what it is that they, what they yeah. teach there for that, that stuff, because that would be very interesting for me to know. Yeah. It would be interesting. I would not be surprised if it's still constructivism. I think one of the problems is that so so little of our education system is based upon that sort of theory. Like a very simple example. I think most, not I guess not everyone, there are, there are all sorts of schools in the U.S., but a lot of schools in the U.S. will have students do spelling quizzes <laughs> with a list of spelling words, you know, especially like elementary and, and so on. You, you kind of get all over that by the time you get to high school. But like elementary through middle school, you have spelling tests. And these are almost entirely set up as the, like, teacher tells you what words to learn. They give you the correct spelling of those. You just have to memorize that and repeat it back to the teacher. But... Even, I mean, and, and people question even the, the value of knowing how to spell something. You know, is that even something valuable? But let's, let's just assume that it is. I mean, I see you shaking your head. No. <laughs> I but, can't spell to I mean, save my yeah, life. So. I mean, eventually computers will be able to figure out, autocorrect will eventually get so good it won't matter. But, until that time, I mean, let's, let's assume that, that spelling is something that's worthwhile. There are many ways that you could assign spelling words and take spelling tests that could be entirely more constructivist, but no, you know, very few people do it this way. I shouldn't say nobody. Lots, there probably are plenty of people that do it this way, but it's not the majority. And so one, first one, you could have the kids pick the words. Yeah. No. Or, or, you know, that would be control over that. Or, you know, that's, I mean, I guess uh, maybe I won't give more than one example, but that's just one one place where you could, you know, make a very simple change to make it at least slightly more constructivist, right? And or you could have each kid pick their own words. Like, you know, if you're really good at spelling Mississippi, why would you know? There's it doesn't make sense to waste time, you know, <laughs> having you study it and then quiz you on it and blah 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 blah. Like maybe you should focus on the words that you know give you trouble until you're pretty good at spelling and then you don't need to worry about it anymore you know that i don't know no that makes sense i uh i'm an 
<clears throat> awful speller, and it took me probably until fifth grade to be able to spell the word because. Because after spelling it so wrong so many times, I finally just made a concerted effort to just learn how to spell it. Yeah, right. And yes, I'm that bad at spelling. Like, <laughs> I can't spell it. Because c- it's... But, uh, but regardless of what it... Like, it was probably on one spelling list sometime early in elementary school, and you were like, this one's hard. I'm just going to take the hit on this one. Or or maybe you tried, but the, but it didn't stick or whatever. But then after that, the next list doesn't have repeats from the previous list. It's just a new list. And so it's like, you don't get that one again. Mm, but yeah. if, yeah, like, and then once you finally made your own concerted effort, it totally panned out, like, right? Like, you you made the effort, and it was your decision, and it makes it, it, makes it feel totally different and blah, blah, blah. Very similar to, you know, the, this this actually reminds me of the, the predictions that that Marxists will say where it's like, okay, if, you know, if if we want to compare what a possible socialist or Marxist or communist society would look like where workers actually own their means of production, control their workplaces, what would be the increase in productivity? What would be the decrease in productivity? You know, because making having more people involved in the decision making process does require more time, uh, often leads to better decisions, but it does require more time. So you have to take that in all into account. But one of the things that no one will ever knows, but is is a decent consideration, is what level of productivity will we gain by giving workers control over it? Ex- for example, when you had control over when you were going to learn the spelling of that word, it was more effective than when someone else told you to, you know. So that's uh, that's something that we just don't know. What productivity gains will there be in 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 a future that gives control to the people doing the work? Actually, honestly, um, there are a lot of like management theories now that try to give control to workers, but that don't give them actual control you know like yeah. give give them a certain amount of control but they they still don't have the real power at the end they don't have the money they don't own the company they don't get to make the big decisions but they get to make big enough decisions that they feel like they have more control over their workplace and that's effective in increasing that worker's productivity oh yeah it yeah. reduces the alienation they feel then i assume because i know for my own work if uh i if I'm listened to, I feel more invested in what I'm doing. Like I actually have a hand in it. So I, yeah, I believe that. Absolutely. And this is something, this is actually extremely interesting. The, uh, I currently work for a private company and one of the weird things that, um, that I thought was weird when I started and still think is weird. And I don't think this actually is probably applies to a lot of private companies, but they use a particular term, which as far as I can tell means being responsible for something, but they don't use the term you are responsible for something. They use this term. They say you own that thing. <laughs> <laughs> like a particular project or a particular whatever it is, you know, like something that needs to be done, you quote unquote own that thing. Well, as a Marxist, it's like, no, I don't own that thing because we know that at, at, as Marxists, we know that anything that's created while I'm on the job belongs to my employer for the most part you know depending on your your conditions of employment but most employment situations in the US the whatever you produce whether it's a service or uh, a good or intellectual property or whatever it happens to be if you produce it as part of your job that thing is not yours you don't, if you work on a car assembly line you don't get to take home the cars at the end of the day. Those belong to your employer. If you program software, guess what? That software is not yours. That software belongs to your employer. They get to sell it and get the money for it or whatever. So th- that's, it's very clear that you don't actually own it 
in a in a technical legal sense they want you to feel that way because they can get the productivity gains from it and and i'm sure people are more productive when they feel like they quote unquote own something but it's not the same as actually legally owning something yeah so do you think that there is a marxist somewhere up in upper management who uh was like hey if we want to get better uh productivity let's do it this way because i mean do you think it's a super conscious thing or just sort of a somewhat intuitive thing i would highly doubt that it comes from a marxist because if you ask um, people that are interested in economics, even from a non-Marxist point of view, like, like that's one of the things that free market people will be entirely in support of is the idea that somebody owns everything. I remember watching this documentary. Probably many of our listeners have heard of it or seen it. If you haven't, check it out. It's a good one. It's called The Corporation. Oh, I have not seen this. It was put out i think in the 90s by like a canadian um group and it's a really long documentary it's like three hours long but it's quite good it's just an analysis of what a corporation is and how they function and uh it's, it's very much from the left point of view although they do have um, it's funny, they, they have, n like, an interview, they have spliced in interviews with Noam Chomsky and, like, left-wing activists, but they also have, like, CEOs and, and right-wing thinkers interviewed, so they show you both people talking. And in one of the interviews with a right-wing person, they go on and on about how the, one of the problems with the environment is that nobody owns those interests, if somebody owned the air, then then no one w you know that person would have an interest in that in that air not being polluted, and so someone would that would be a good thing is for someone to own certain pieces of air, Jeez. so that uh, they could look after those interests. Well, it's I don't think it. I mean, as far as who should own air or not, that's kind of you know a, a silly example maybe, but. I think the truth in it is this, that both Marxists and um, right-wing thinkers can agree that owning something gives you more incentive for that thing, gives you more incentive to look after it or to do well on that thing or whatever. But from the Marxist, so the, the right-wing people say, okay, so then everything should be quote-unquote privately owned. But we, I think as a Marxist, it makes even more sense to go one step farther and say, well, yeah, you can privately own something, but we have lots of situations of private ownership where the people doing the work for that privately owned thing are not the owners. You know, yeah. like, a, like a very simple example is a corporation like Walmart, or really any corporation, but, you know, we'll take Walmart as an example just because we love to bash Walmart. Uh, where a small number of people, like the Walton family, own that corporation, and vast numbers of people, probably hundreds of thousands, I don't know how many they employ, but a lot, I think they're the largest uh, private employer in the U.S. I think so, yeah. They were vast numbers of people, you know, so we've got a small number of people that, you know, Maybe they do work for the company or maybe not. They don't actually have to. They can just own it and just receive their dividends. That's fine. You know, that's that's the structure of, of stocks is you, you can receive dividends without doing anything. So they can just own it and sit there. They don't have to do anything. Maybe they do. I don't know. But the people that do have to do the work don't own any of it. They they get they have no ownership in it. So it's like okay, if we agree on that fact, then that leads to the conclusion that the most productive workplace is one that is owned by the workers. Yeah, yeah. Because when you, the example of air, that made me think. Well, don't we all sort of just collectively own the air? I mean, we all collectively, you know, live in the environment, so collectively it all sort of belongs to us unofficially yeah so then we well, you know, uh, that's where 
like the government needs to step in, which they do ish yeah. in this country. I mean, I guess not. Many others. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, we have like EPA standards and all that, but yeah, it's not it's not quite the same. And yeah, it for certain things, it's like physically impossible to have like ownership at the individual level yeah. or at least unless you're going to have like canned air or something yeah. like ridiculous like that like the, like the, the oxygen bar fad yeah that existed for a while well the problem with air is if you say i own the air above the united states but you own that air that occupies it now do you own air that happens to go in there because you know what is it that the air you breathe out now will be you know halfway around the world in six months or something like that you know it just it all gets <laughs> dispersed no you know it's one planet one atmosphere it yeah. all you know it's my air is your air is everyone's air yep it's just it sort of spreads itself around slowly yeah anyway do you want to talk about your experiences as a teacher yeah that's that's kind of interesting i mean so i, I did used to teach in public schools and that was also almost anything you do as this is what I found almost anything I do as a Marxist, I learn a lot about that system and feel like I kind of understand it in in ways that other folks working in that industry don't don't think about it or or just haven't considered or or maybe they get the feel like a certain feeling in their gut but they they don't have the words or the concepts to kind of explain it fully and so when it came to teaching this is this is kind of where i ended up teaching is a battleground for class warfare hmm. which yeah, I know that's a dramatic way to say it. Doesn't, I mean, I should publish a book with that title, right? Education, a battleground for class warfare. Although it probably would make people go nuts if I did. But whatever. It'd sell then, which, ugh. I hate it, oh, myself it that I said that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's some marketing right there. Uh, everyone who's listening who's a marketing major, which is like one guy, <laughs> you write that one down. Tell, tell, tell your lefty friends to write that book. But, um, no, it really, this is what I mean by that, is that, uh, is there a, like, there's this component of education where it's, you know, collectively paid for via taxation and that it's supposed to enlighten people to be positive and good citizens that are informed and can make decisions. In many ways, it's the last bastion of democracy. You know, in a public school, every not everyone gets the same education, actually, but at least everyone gets an education, and and you you have people lar oftentimes in the same building from all different backgrounds. So there there's a lot of good things about it, and there's a lot of great things that teachers do, but there's also another component to it, which even if you try to resist. The system compels you to be complicit in it at, at the very least, if not participate in it. And that is that education not only does these great, wonderful things that we support, but it also essentially gets students ready to be good servants for their future corporate overlords. Which I've, yeah, again, I've, I've said that in a particularly provocative way. But you get what, I could say it in a, a more friendly way that's not so provocative, but you get the, the thing is that, um, in fact, in fact, if you think about it, that's largely what a lot of people will say school should be, but they'll just use different terms for it. If you, if you listen to pundits and other people on, on TV and radio talk about the purpose of school, many times they will implicitly assume that oftentimes they don't even say it out loud. They just make the assumption and then start with the argument based on that assumption that education is for getting that person ready to have a job. Oftentimes they may say a, a good job, which is good. And I, I mean, I'm, I've got to be honest, it would be a, a disservice as an educator to not prepare students for having a job. But is that the only thing? 
that they should be ready for? And also, what does having a job mean in our world? You know, like, the, does it mean the most important thing is that you can show up on time? Like, is that why we have a bell system where, where kids, you know, will, will stop working at one bell? You know, it's, it's the old factory style that, I mean, a lot of educational theorists will tell you that's why we have a bell system with this, with the uh, school day broken into periods like that, because it was like the bell system on the factory line. Like, you had to be there when the whistle sounded at the beginning of the day, otherwise the assembly line won't work. And so that's why we have a bell system and you get penalized if you're late. And even if you're really interested in math, when that bell rings to tell you that math is done, you better close that math book and be ready to completely change tracks to a completely different way of thinking when you go to gym class or... or English class or whatever. Like, you have to be able to turn off what you are doing like that and just start doing something else whenever you're told to. That kind of just blew my mind. I That never crossed my mind before, and that makes perfect <laughs> sense. Yeah. So, I mean, the, and I think largely, honestly, it's, it's kind of sad because our economy has largely changed, but I'm not sure education, I mean, some schools get away from the bell system, but largely it's still kept in place. And our workplaces have actually moved beyond that, where now we have a lot of white-collar workplaces where what matters is that you can accomplish a task over a period of weeks, and there are no bells to tell you when to start or stop. Actually, why is high school education formated li formulated like that? And why is college education formulated a completely different way? Like, you still need to be on time for class, but what's more important in college is that you are given an assignment that is due in two months, and there's a lot of work that needs to be done, and eventually, you know, maybe the first year of college you can get it done the day before, or whatever, if you're, if you happen to be a bright person. But eventually it gets to the point where your assignments get larger and larger, where the first day of the semester, you get your assignment that's due the last day of the semester. And it's the, the, it's just basically stretching out your timeline so that you can manage yourself effectively. That's what college is teaching you to do, is to be able to manage yourself effectively. And if you can do that, then you get to have one of these other kind of jobs where you're given that kind of responsibility where it's like okay we need xyz to happen and you need to coordinate and do many of these things over the course of a long time and if you if on any given day you don't do it or you don't make very much progress no one's going to notice but by the end of this time it needs to all be there and that's a particular type of job, usually a relatively privileged job, usually a salaried job here in the United States, usually one that pays higher and requires a college education. But that's what college is, is getting you ready to say that you can do that kind of job. Whereas the high school education says you can show up on time because your job is going to be like shift based, you know, you, you have to be there to cover the shift, whether you're a cashier or whatever, and you need to be able to be done when you're done and, and all that kind of stuff. Like you got to be able to fo essentially just show up and follow the rules. And so that's why there's these different levels of education, which is kind of a sad way to think about it. But I was very conscious of that as an educator. And I thought, okay, that I can't just, it, it will eventually cause a problem you know, it's still important for students to show up on time, so it'll be eventually be a problem if I just ignore this outright completely. But at the same time, I also want to maximize the number of experiences and lessons and, and, and things like that that my students receive that teach them to think critically, to, to question the world around them, to essentially be informed citizens that can make a difference in the world. Because that's also a part of education. But the question is, which part gets emphasized more and which, which part ends up uh, winning in the long run? And that was something that I constantly struggled with because many people, the people throughout the whole system are accustomed 
largely to it being the the bad way that I described. You know, they're used to that. They're used to here is my here is my spelling list. I need to memorize these ten or twenty words, and then on Monday I show you that I have done that and I get an A. Or I get a C because that's what I'm used to. But like everyone's used to this this system that does it that way, including the other teachers, the parents, the students, the administrators. And so when you try to change the system for the better, people get angry because they say, this isn't the thing that I'm used to. Just I, I, every year up to now, I've known what I've needed to do to get my A and move on or my B or my C or whatever I care to get. You know, usually there is like a target level that a student or a parent has decided is an acceptable level and they just shoot for that, which grades is a whole nother thing. If you want, if, if listeners are interested, there's an entire critique of even having grades in school and whether or not it's an effective means for learning or if it, what grades actually do is just a way to create a hierarchy among students and future workers but that okay so if you're interested in that i'll recommend elfie cone that's k-o-h-n is an educational theorist who writes very good critiques of of grading systems and a whole bunch of other stuff but yeah you you the the short answer is is there's many ways to learn even without grades there are uh, a small number, well, a small percentage, but still a, a decent number of schools in the U.S. that don't actually use grades, and students learn quite a bit by without having them. Arguably better than other schools, I, I would agree with that. But, you know, basically, people understand a particular system, they've gotten used to it, they don't want to learn a new system, and they are unhappy with changing it, which was infinitely frustrating as an educator. So I, I want to sort of jump to the critical thinking a little bit because in my experience with education, that has very much been the very vocally their goal. But I, I mean, not from the point of view you've had, but there definitely seems to be a contradiction there with the wanting people to think critically versus not wanting to change things. And Things are largely set up to not encourage much critical thinking. I don't know how to phrase it. It seems well, yeah, like there's a big yeah. contradiction there between yeah. your aims and sort of just the everyday business of it. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's absolutely right. That the critical thinking is almost universally praised by educators. And, and I think for good reason. I don't think, let, let me be clear here that I don't think I think there are very few, if any, educators out there who say, what I want to do is mold people to be good drones for the capitalist system so we can continue that economic structure. You know, people don't say that. They get into education because they love learning, because they love English or math or social studies or history, you know, whatever. They love their subject. They love learning. They love kids. They go into it for all the right reasons. And they probably support those things as they go through. But does the system force them to also support the this other component that I've talked about? Yes. What in and you you know you don't necessarily need to think about it in these terms to support it. It's I mean honestly, if you just go with the flow and do your job, which is you know the job is a hard job, and to make it harder by trying to question these things and to provide an education according to the set of criteria that I think we would agree with makes makes the job honestly even harder. So it's it's a very difficult thing as an educator to do that. But specifically on the topic of of critical thinking, I think there's lots of things that folks can mean when they say critical thinking. And and I I would venture to say that very few educators think about the things in education that may discourage critical thinking. Yeah, like if I start arguing about homework, about, well, how is this helping me engage with the material? I'm not thinking, you know, this is 
yeah. justify this to me. I want to understand the reason for this. Explain to me where this fits in into my learning this topic you're saying. I'm guessing they're not going to have a positive reaction if you try and think critically about the things they're giving you. No, and honestly, as a former educator, I that was something, you know, like if a student asks something like that, it, at first it was something that I thought, oh, this student is critically thinking. That's a good thing. But I realized, actually, because students... This is going to sound awful, but I'll, I'll say it anyway. Most students that are playing that game are not playing the critical thinking game. They're playing the, ah, I've realized that I've analyzed this teacher's temperament and realized that this argument may, in fact, get buy me some headway in not having to do certain work. <laughs> Which is, it's like, okay, that, like, they're already trying to game the system. Like, that's because they've been accustomed to it, you know? And so, yeah, that is, that is often not a encouraged kind of critical thinking. And even, even me, who is a Marxist, totally into critical thinking and questioning authority and everything like that, I quickly learned that this was not a, you know, questioning an assignment was not going to be it wasn't going to be effective use of my time if I engaged a student in that discussion. It was just opening the door to a ton of other problems that I wasn't going to have the time or energy to deal with, <laughs> unfortunately. So that, yeah. But, but I mean, uh, along the... I want to also come back. I keep coming back to your question, because I think your question was also about how can you support critical thinking, but then also essentially train a student to be a good employee. Yeah. And this is, I think this is something that Noam Chomsky has commented on, and I, I largely agree with him when, when he says something along these lines, which is students are taught to think critically in certain cases. Like, to do a difficult math problem, you need to think critically in a certain way. Or to analyze a historical document, you need to think critically in a, in a specific way. But those are very different kinds of thinking critically. And there are many different kinds of thinking critically. And one of them is to think about the systems to which you are, uh, which you are a part of. And that is is the line that needs to be drawn, is you must be able to think critically on how do we solve this complex problem, how do I, as a manager at a company, you have to think about how to resolve issues between employees, you know, that's a, a complex problem that encompasses, encompasses things like psychology and motivation and, and personal preferences and things like that, like these are all complex tasks that one needs to be able to think cri critically about, and, but it's totally possible to be able to think critically about all of those without questioning the economic system or, or this power division at a particular company, especially if you think about it like, oh, my company is a hierarchical company where there are workers and then supervisors and then managers and then senior managers or whatever, like, you know, all the terms that are used in business to describe the hierarchy of people. And that's a very easy thing to not question if every other company is doing it the same way or most other companies are doing it the same way. You know, the idea that, you know, like, it's very rare, but every once in a while, a company oh, that's very progressive or very worker-centric might have the workers, you know, I I think this is something that happened, I think I heard this about Mondragon, which is, like, the largest worker co-op, and it's located in Spain, and blah, blah, blah. You've probably heard a lot about it if you're listening to this podcast. If not, you can find a lot of material on it if you Google it, I'm sure. It's, like, one of the the sources that lefties often cite as a particularly good business. One of the things they do there is they will vote for their CEO, if I'm not mistaken, and, you know, the workers get to vote for that person and, and decide who that's going to be. Well, the idea that you would vote for that person is not something that exists at other 
workplaces, and that's just taken as common knowledge. Like, yeah, of course you don't vote for that person. That per- We don't say who that person is. They get to hire us and decide who we are. You know, yeah. that's... So it's easy to not question sh- certain things, especially if they are widely accepted. Yeah. And another thing that I wonder, I know I think about this a lot, um, and I'm sure you do, is sort of the the double life you sort of lead as a Marxist in a capitalist society. You know, you're aware of all of these things going around you on a level that other people don't think about. You know how the systems are sort of set up and why this is doing that. And while you understand it in, you know, this other way, you don't have much of a choice. I mean, it's not like... I, I know a lot of times on uh internet and stuff, people will be smeared as hypocrites because, you know, oh, like I, I went to Target today, so how could I support a capitalist corporation if I'm a Marxist? You know, it's a contradiction that, I mean, there's really no other option for the living in a capitalist culture, like... yeah. Yeah, exactly. It, being a Marxist is not like being a vegetarian. Like, when you're a vegetarian, you have a certain belief, and then you're able to live exactly to that belief. Like, you can just eat the things that you believe are legitimate to eat. But being a Marxist, it's what it's not about your individual actions. It's about... The, how the organization of society, that's, that's the thing that we care about. And so, you know, I think it's great to support businesses that are cooperatively owned and, and run and organized by workers and things like that. But it's not about just what we support. It's about changing the entire world that we live in. And, yeah, that, I mean, it's... I don't think of it as being hypocritical, but yeah, of course, like, it's easy for other people to say that, but it's like, it's someone who thinks that being a Marxist is being, is like being a vegetarian that says that kind of thing, kind of conflating that or, or, or missing the point that, that the point is, you know, it's sort of like when people say, it's actually, it's very similar to this, I think, when people say, well, if you don't like how like a law or or whatever you don't like something specifically about the united states why don't you move away then and actually I'll, i've even heard it with workplaces where if you don't like how this workplace does this thing why don't you quit and get a different job and i think that that you know that's a strategy that some people may in fact take and that's fine but there's a completely other strategy that people who say, why don't you move away, are ignoring, which is, why don't you just change, like, work to change that thing so it's better? Let, I, let's, let's make a really funny comparison here. Let, let's, let's say, I don't like my house because there's a lot of trash laying around. <laughs> and then those people, what, what their answer is, is, well, why don't you just move? Why don't you move to a different house if you don't like all the trash that's laying around? And my answer actually is, why don't you pick up the trash? Like, why don't you change the thing so that it is now better in the way that you want it to be? That, like, that's also a legitimate thing and also sometimes the more sensical thing to do. And if the problem is that you care for the well-being of other people and you know like for example if say it's something like like gay marriage or whatever and it's like okay if if it's not legal in such and such a state why don't you move to this other state well you you could do that that's an option but if you also care about the people who choose to continue to live in that state then you're not really solving that problem by moving away, right? You have dodged it personally, but you haven't, the problem still exists. You're just in a different place now. You're just, you're just ignoring it or, or it's easier for you to forget about because it, it's, it's not where you are. It's, it, it'd be, it would be like if the answer to pollution was to move to a place that wasn't polluted yet. 
or whatever. You know, it's like, mm, it's still a problem that it's there. That's like, my, my belief set isn't just that I should not live in a place that's polluted, but also that there shouldn't be that much pollution <laughs> or whatever, you know? So that, I don't know, I guess that's kind of the, the thing that gets ignored when when someone may may turn to a Marxist and say, "Well, you're a hypocrite because you you are employed at a capitalist business and you make money from that." And it's like, uh, yeah, that's like I understand the situ the you know because because the other thing will happen too. Okay, this is this is this is it. You'll get it coming and going. Because it's sort of like, if you're employed at a capitalist enterprise and you get a paycheck from that, you know, obviously we're Marxists, so we know that you're exploited. So the reason that your boss pays you that amount is because they make more than that amount from the work you do. Otherwise, they're not a very savvy business investor. <laughs> the the So we understand that. But, you know, you'll be criticized for making a paycheck. Or the opposite side, if you do the other thing, if if you don't, then the criticism is, well, you don't even work. So what, you know, how can you be, you know, how can you critique this system if you, you're not even participating in it? You know, that, that's one of the things that people like to say about Karl Marx is, oh, he didn't even have a job, which I, I mean, he did like contract work for a lot of newspapers and stuff like that, kind of like piecemeal stuff, but it's not necessarily a legit cr criticism, but, but even, even if it is like, so say 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 he never worked ever during his entire life. Either if he did or didn't, there would be a whole group of people saying, "Oh, see, he made look at how much his paycheck was. He you know he was complicit in this system, so he his critique can't be real. Or he didn't even work, so how can we you know value his opinion if he wasn't even part of it? He was just critiquing it from the outside. So and you, then you get it either way. And then there's Lenin's opinion, which is you need a group of people who their sole job is to be propped up by people making money so that they can devote their time and energy to revolutionary things. Because if Marx was spending 11, 12 hours a day working in a factory, we would have nothing from him, essentially. No, oh, that's true. And, you know, it's more valuable that he spent his time on that. And, you know, other people have to support him in that case. In his case, Engels who happily supported him because I think he realized exactly the same thing. Yep. Well, anything else? No, I mean, I don't know if that was a, a full picture of who I am, but we at least went on some rants, so that was good. <laughs> well, it doesn't have to be a full picture. I mean, it gets That's a true. glimpse into uh, who you are and what you care about. That's true. <laughs> This episode is part of the Marxism Today podcast series. Marxism Today is recorded, mixed, edited, produced, and maintained by Tony Schmidt and Red Wagner. It is distributed freely and licensed under the Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike 3.0 license. To find out more about the Marxism Today podcast, visit our website at marxismtodaypodcast.wordpress.com where you can find archives of all of our episodes available for download. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time.